welcome here to a place called the Unfinished Obelisk. You can see it behind me, an obelisk which is still laying down. And for those of us who have seen these types of obelisks in Rome or in Paris or different places where eventually, you know, the conquering peoples would take them away from Egypt, now we understand how they were made. The reason we're here is we're going to talk a little bit about slavery. We know that the Hebrew people were here and they were slaves. What we hear and read about in the Bible is that they made bricks. Most definitely they did. We'll see some of these places that they helped to build. But also they had hundreds and hundreds of slaves making these very spiritual objects behind us. So let me tell you a little bit about them and then we can understand how much manpower it took to make these obelisks. From this vantage point behind me, you can see again this part of the obelisk and also down below. Behind me, you can see even today in this very you know, hot part of the summer, which is just ending and, and the winter's coming, you can see the reeds and you can see water. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about what they did here when they would make these obelisks. They would carve different little holes along the whole edge of what they wanted to make. This very, very long obelisk had little holes all the way down each side. And they would put little pieces of wood in there and then they would put water in that. And so during the hot summers that, that wood and water would expand and it would crack open the, the granite. And then from there they would carve out around it. Once they had most of the obelisk carved out, and you can see in this one, it's, it's fairly well carved around the sides, they would bring in any type of wood that they can find. And it's not as if there's tons of trees around here, but any type of wood would work. And they would, they would um, uh, tie them around this obelisk, and then they would float it here, where you can see this water. Even today it fills with water, but back then when the Nile wasn't controlled, it would flood and the water would come in here and they would be able to kind of manage it around and then float it onto this water and eventually make it to the Nile. And then once it was on the Nile, they would take it to the different uh, temples because these were spiritual objects. They were made by the pharaohs to be able to connect earth to heaven. And so it was this that the slaves were working on. But you can imagine how difficult it would be for them not just to wait for this to you know expand and to crack and then to cut it open and then they would polish it and then they would carve in prayers from the pharaoh to the gods for the people and so this was work that would take years in fact they said that this particular obelisk was made during the reign of the female uh, pharaoh and she made in the course of 20 years five obelisks and so it takes about four years or so to make one obelisk and they, of course they would do different things around here as well but the time and the manpower is just amazing and so you can actually the guy told us you can imagine um, the slaves working here in the summer times which is when they would work because they had it had had to have it all prepared for the winter when it would flood so this was hard hard labor these people were longing for freedom From this vantage point down behind me, you can see the entire harbor where they would have the boats waiting for this place to flood. So let's talk a little bit about what happened to the people in Exodus. I want to read from the book of Exodus chapter 1, starting with verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the sons of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war befalls us, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. And this is the key right here. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. And they built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the sons of Israel. So they made the sons of Israel serve with rigor and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the fields. In all their work, they made them serve with rigor. 
So all of this was happening because of the number of the Israelites, of the Hebrews here in Egypt. But they had plenty of work to do, that is for sure. And so I'd like you to just picture them, you know, cutting out all of these, you know, obelisks, these stones. Anything that was made in Egypt out of granite actually came from Aswan, came from here. This is where they have the big granite mountains. And so they probably were all over this area, not just in Goshen up in the north, but certainly in this area as well, working very, very hard. Because as I mentioned, these obelisks, these um, granite uh, obelisks were made for the temples and those were up and down the Nile. And so this was the main route and this is where the people would come and go, including the slaves that would work so hard for the pharaohs. As we make our way up the Nile to some of the most striking temples and funerary monuments in Egypt, we need to remember that there were a lot of slaves in Egypt at that time. And the ancient Israelites lived in the north in Goshen, over 500 miles away from the granite quarries to the south, about 400 miles from the great temples in Luxor. Karnak and Luxor temples were built between, well, they were beginning in the year 2000 BC with a lot of construction between 1600 BC, 1200 BC. All of this coincides with the time of the Exodus. Did they work there? Well, we don't know. But what we do know is in the temple of Karnak, the god Amun was worshipped, the god of the creator of the universe. At that time, he became known as Amun-Ra. Ra was the god of the sun and of light, who traveled across the sky every day in a burning ark or boat from east to west. Also in Karnak lived Mut, who was the mother goddess, the mother of everything, and of the moon child named Khonsu. And Khonsu's name means traveler. The three of them would visit the Luxor temple from Karnak during the Opet festival. And the most important thing, however, is the proper transmission of the royal Ka and that's the ensuring of the maintenance of kingship through the soul, the Ka, of the legitimate king. So Karnak and Luxor have a striking majesty that reminds us of our great dignity. And this dignity brings us and the ancient Israelites to cry out for freedom to be able to live that dignity. Let's go see these temples. As we're walking through these pylons, we see the sun rise right in front of us. This is exactly what the Egyptians were thinking when they built these temples because the Amun-Ra, the god of the sun, is coming up straight over the mountains, which the pylons represent, and you see his sanctuary right in the front. And then right in front of us, on the other side as I turn around, I am looking at the Valley of the Kings, and that is on the west bank of the Nile, where they are buried. So the sun has been born, and now it's going to die as the day ends on the other side. Walking into this beautiful, huge temple of Karnak. We're passing right now through what they call the Avenue of the Sphinxes. This was put in much later by a later pharaoh and he was represented by a ram that's where they're on the shape of the rams and this avenue is extraordinary as it goes all the way from the temple of karnak to the temple of luxor these pylons are 200 feet tall massive and give you a great sense of majesty and grandeur We are walking toward one of the most extraordinary sites, I think, here in this unfinished part of the temple of Karnak. And these are the mud bricks here on this side of the pylon. The pylon just means this big wall that looks like uh, a mountain. And so you can see behind me these mud bricks. And what they would use those for is they would go up those bricks to polish these sandstone pieces of block and then they would carve the hieroglyphics and different figures into them and so they would then eventually take these mud bricks away which is just an extraordinary way of them to uh, make these kind of temples and figures and i'm going to take you over here so you can see an unfinished column as well 
These are not like obelisks that are made from one piece of stone. These are actually different pieces of stone brought together, piled on each other, and then with the same style of mud brick, they would put the slaves or the workers next to them and they would polish them probably with granite which was certainly a stronger stone and uh, put sand between the granite and the sandstone sand it down and then carve very deeply the figures into these columns and into these pylons because this was Ramses II who wanted to make sure that all of his story would last for a very long time one of the greatest builders and greatest pharaohs of this time and we can get a very clear picture of these um, sphinxes with the ram heads, which has to do with the king at that time, who was actually a Nubian king, and so he was represented by a ram horn, a ram head. And these would actually be outside of the temple. Um, so this would have been outside of the temple, and then it was expanded later. We're going to head down this way and show you what Ramses III, who came, of course, after Ramses II, built specific for, specifically for the god Amun-Ra, who was the main god in this temple of Karnak. So you can see in front of me this hieroglyphic or this deep etching of Amun-Ra. He's got that crown of Egypt on his head. And here is the opening to the temple that Ramses III wanted to build specifically for him because as we said before, the pharaohs always wanted to build onto temples that already existed for their glory. And so when they were in power, they wanted to honor the gods. And so that's why year by year, century by century, even millennium by millennium, really century by century, these temples continue to expand and grow. place in Karnak is so massive and so beautiful. It can't help but almost raise your mind and your heart to God. In fact, many people say that this was about the size of the temple eventually that they made in Jerusalem. Who knows if generations after those who built this place were actually the ones who built that temple of the Lord where he stayed. But it speaks to not only bringing our souls, our minds, and our hearts up to heaven, it tells us details about our dignity. And these are the seeds of faith that were actually sown in this very interesting interesting religion, this mythology of the Egyptian people. So I want to point some of those things out. <clears throat> and that is the dignity that we all have. Now here in these temples, we know that it was Pharaoh and the priests that would come in here. Pharaoh for a number of reasons that we'll talk about when we go to Luxor. But the priests came in, of course, every day and many times of the day to do different offerings and services. And they wanted to make the gods happy. Pharaoh came in because he was the one that was in communication with the Lord. He was the one that became an for centuries and, and millennium, divine. That's why he became a god for the people here in Egypt, especially uh, the Pharaoh Ramses II, whom we know very well, Ramses III, who helped build some of the beautiful parts of Karnak. And so they had great dignity in the eyes of all the Egyptian people. Now, we are reminded in our Christian faith that all of us are made in the image and likeness of God. It wasn't just the Pharaoh. It wasn't just the priests. All of us are called to enter into this temple. In fact, all of us are called to be like this temple because we are created in his, in his image and likeness. And just as we walk through that huge forest of columns, each one of those columns is beautiful in and of itself. And so there's the divine beauty in each one of us. It's present in every single human being, but also if you take it all together, that's what makes it so extraordinary. And that means that the dignity of the human person shines forth in communion in the communion of persons. And that's something that we're going to start seeing the Lord bring his people, uh, the Israelite people, to understand little by little as they're going through their exodus and through the desert. Now, the second thing about this, um, there's three characteristics about this dignity that it's, it's good for us to remember as we begin our exodus. One, that man is fulfilled, or excuse me, man is created in the image of God, but he is created in dignity, meaning He's not created for a purpose. He's not created to be useful. He's not created to, to do something. What's my mission in life? You have no mission. I have no mission. 
Do you know what we're destined for? Just like this temple brings us up to eternity, we are destined to be happy forever. Not useful, just to be happy. That's why we were created. That makes us filled with dignity. Secondly, every single person participates in the light and power of the divine spirit. We don't have to go into special places within the temple, like the birthing room that we'll talk about in just a second, like Pharaoh did, to become divine. No, we have that within us because we have intelligence, to see and to understand, and we have the will to choose what is good. In fact, our dignity allows that choice to bring us to greater and greater perfection. In fact, we have this voice within us, and that's the third thing, and that's conscience. It's the voice of God. We don't need Pharaoh to tell us what the Lord is saying. He's actually right here. I can hear him. It's that voice telling me, do this avoid this, do good and avoid evil. And in doing that, I become more perfect, more happy, and I achieve the purpose in that sense for which I was made, and that is just divine beatitude, which simply means my joy and my happiness. So we are created in his image and likeness with all of those characteristics. And secondly, the big point is we are fulfilled. We are fulfilled in glory. So it's almost as if we are... Um, made perfect when we come into a temple like this. And I want to just quote from St. Augustine. Remember, he was writing in the fourth century, and he said in his confessions, when he's talking to the Lord, how is it then that I seek you, Lord? Since in seeking you, my God, I seek a happy life. Let me seek you so that my soul may live. For my body draws life from my soul, and my soul draws life from you. Our dignity means that we are fulfilled in our call to be attitude. We're going to keep that word in our minds and hearts as we go through Exodus and then make this typolo typological jump into the New Testament. We are fulfilled in bliss and joy in the unity with the Lord himself. It's not just Pharaoh. No, it's each and every one of us that are united with the Lord entering into his kingdom, entering into eternity, into the vision of God, the joy of the Lord, and God's rest. So as we continue to look through this beautiful place of Karnak, and we take that passageway, that alley that takes us from here to the Temple of Luxor, let's remember our vocation to divine beatitude and recall the dignity that we have within us and that we are called to live in doing what is not only living a life as we see in these hieroglyphs but living a suitable life a life that is good follow me Welcome to Luxor. We have just made this three kilometer long path with these sphinxes that lines the way all the way from the Temple of Karnak here to Luxor. And the reason they line this path is an ancient ceremony called Opet, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about when we go into the temple. But one of the most important things to keep in mind is this is almost like an analogy of that pathway of Exodus, a pathway to freedom. At least when we're taking this path with the gods on their shoulders as the Egyptians would have carried the goddess and the goddesses, the god and the goddess 
and then their son from Karnak to uh, Luxor. It reminds us of our great dignity where the angels will guide us and carry us on their shoulders, on their wings into heaven. So as we continue our Exodus journey, let's remember why the Lord is freeing us from so much. So here in Luxor, the name meaning the fortress, it actually comes from an Arabic word meaning that because it is so large and they did build a fortress here afterwards. This is important because of that Opet festival. You can imagine how incredible it would have been for the gods to be carried from Karnak all the way here, but they didn't only carry them on their shoulders. They actually put them on the Nile, even though the two temples are parallel to the Nile, because they were in boats. Now these boats have nothing to do with water. They actually go over the sands toward the sun, the setting sun, which would be toward eternity. Now the Opet festival is simply this festival when they come here, but it's the great gathering of the three gods together so they can have some time of rest. At the beginning it was a 10 day festival, became a 20 day festival, and it was something where everyone was joyous because they had a chance to come together. And this shows us the dignity not only of the individual, but also of the community together. But I wanna point out how it does show us the seeds of our own faith. You know, you had this holy family there, the, the god, sun god, and then his wife and the son, but they also were like a trinity of gods together. And that's what makes this so remarkable. Now, the neat thing here about Luxor is it wasn't a place where they actually had a god inside. It was just for the place, the place for them to come together. Now, another thing about many of the temples, not this one in particular, but one that I'm gonna show you uh, a little bit further uh, south in Egypt, which would be further what do they call that? Lower Egypt. It's a temple where there is a birth chamber, chamber that happened much later in the time of Egypt. And that was when the pharaohs wanted to go in and find their divinization. And so it's as if they, in a sense, married the divinity and they were born. They were born into this divine uh, dimension of who they are as the pharaohs. And so that is the birth chamber. But we have to remember in our own lives and the reason why the Lord wants to free his people and take them in Exodus is so they can find the dignity that's already inside of them. So the Pharaohs had to come to the temples to gain their dignity or to be recognized as dignity. In fact, you can see behind me all these colossal statues of one man, and that man was Ramses II. He made himself equal to the gods. And he wanted to make sure everyone around knew that, that his friends knew that, his people knew that, but especially his enemies knew that. But we already have the divinity inside. In fact, as Pope Leo the Great said in the fourth century, remember your dignity. Why are we doing this Exodus journey? To remember our dignity, actually even more than that. So the Lord can bring out the dignity which is inside. Now, Pope Leo this actually said the following, and this actually completes that thought. He says, recognize your dignity. And now that you share in God's own nature, do not return to your former base condition by sinning. Even the Pharaoh who let the Israelites go recognize that he sinned. He still had a hard heart, but he at least recognized that. So this is what we're doing in our Exodus. And then he goes on, remember who is your head and of whose body you are a member. Never forget that you have been rescued from the power of darkness and brought into the light of the kingdom of God. Recognize our dignity. Remember why we are called to this exodus and what we are called to when we live true freedom. So to keep that in mind and actually to also experience a little bit about what the Egyptian people felt when they looked upon these temples with the Nile right there, these mud bricks protecting this temple from the flooding when that Nile would go up and down. Um, let's go in and just be amazed by the beauty of this and take our place in a certain sense among the gods. These temples, funerary monuments, and so many other structures like the store cities of Pithom and Ramses were built by a combination of paid hard laborers, prisoners of war, and slaves. Making mud, straw, bricks was used all over Egypt, just like it says in Exodus. 
There were depictions actually of enslaved prisoners of war, Semites from Canaan and Syria, working with African Nubians right to the south of Egypt, prisoners of war making bricks overseen by Egyptian taskmasters. And they even have a depiction of mud brick making for a building project at Karnak. In addition to this, there are depictions of prisoners of war working in agriculture, just like in Exodus 114. It says the ancient Israelites, Israelites worked in brick, mortar, and agriculture. So we have evidence for this in the 15th century BC. What about in the Nile Delta where the ancient Israelites lived? Well, as I mentioned, there is this discussion about when the Exodus really took place. There's an archeologist who studied the graves from the Middle Bronze Age or the 13th Dynasty in an area called Avaris, an Eastern area of the Delta. And what he found was a community of Semites. And he looked at their graves and it shows a sudden deterioration in their quality of life. First, they were healthy bones and everything seemed to be expanding. And suddenly their bones indicate a shortage of food and nutrients. And they seem to live only 30 years rather than the 50 or 60 years from before. Such a sudden change of prosperity to tough lives could point to slavery. There's a document called the Brooklyn Papyrus that has the names of slaves from one household in that area at that time. 70% of them are Hebrew slaves with names like Issachar and Asher, the same names as the 12, two of the 12 tribes of Israel. There's even the name of Shipra, who's the, the same name as the Egyptian midwife mentioned in Exodus. So these indicate that this people in the north suddenly came on hard times. These suffering ancient Israelite slaves were crying out for freedom. God saw, God heard, and God knew. At the same time, he was drawing one out from the water and preparing him to lead his people back to freedom, back to knowing and living according to their true dignity. Thank you for joining us today in this wonderful walk. God bless you and know that we are praying for you from this very holy land of the history of salvation.